Thank you, ma'am. Good evening to everyone. I hereby call this October the 11th meeting of the Public Safety Committee to order. Uh, due to the Safer at Home order, all committee members are participating virtually. For virtual meetings, committee members will be muted until they've been asked to be heard. When there is a vote, it'll be necessary to take a roll call vote and the committee member will be recognized. They'll raise their hand and they'll state their vote. Um, I'd like to turn it over to the city clerk to call the roll, please. Council Member Larson. Present. Council Member Burke. Here. Council Member Mundy. Present. Council Member Taylor. Present. So we have a full committee here today. Um, before we say anything, we'd like to take this time uh, to always honor the brave men and women of the police department, the fire department, and the emergency management departments. We appreciate everything you do to protect and serve this city. Uh, we couldn't do it without you, so we just want you to know that you are appreciated, and we do it every single meeting at this time. Uh, members of the committee, there's only one item on the consent agenda, and that's the approval of the Public Safety Committee uh, Summary of Minutes. Um, if everybody's read those minutes, if, if there's a motion, I'd entertain one at this time on the consent agenda. Move for Chair. approval of C1. Second. Second, Burke. Okay, it's been motion and properly seconded. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, if you call the roll, please. Council Member Larson. Yes. Council Member Burke. Yes. Council Member Mundy. Aye. Council Member Taylor. Yes. Uh, so that is unanimous on the consent agenda. Now we move to item G1, please. <coughs> Item G1, recognition of members of the Winston-Salem Firefighter Combat Challenge Team. Um, I'm excited to hear from Chief Mayo on this particular item, but before we recognize Chief Mayo, I want to recognize Assistant City Manager Patrice Tony. Thank you, Chairman Taylor, and good evening to your committee and other council members. Um, I would like to recognize our Chief Mayo um, to, to introduce this item. Chief Mayo, you have the floor, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, to you and the members of the committee. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, Madam uh, Assistant City Clerk, may I share my screen? Yes. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we... Uh, Back uh, September 8th through the 10th, uh, there was a firefighter combat challenge competition in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. And uh, we sent the bulls, as we like to do, uh, several times a year so that we qualify for the, for the uh, world championships. And um, I have, uh, let's see, I can't see them now because I'm sharing my screen, but they are on the call. And uh, I'm going to call their names if they'll just give a wave there. I think they're all seated together. Uh, Pat Davison, Ben Emmert, A.J. Stovall, Chaz Browning. I'm not sure A.J.'s in that, in that, in that screen you're looking at. Um, Chaz Browning, Jordan Luswick, and Jonathan Watterson. And uh, when, uh, in this competition up in Anne Arundel, uh, I am proud to, to announce that uh, the team came back with the first place team. That was Ben, Chaz, Jonathan, and AJ. The first place tandem, Pat and Jordan. First place in the relay, Ben, Pat, Jonathan, AJ, and Jordan. They also brought home the third place tandem, Chaz and AJ. The fourth place individual, Ben. The fifth place individual, Chaz. The sixth place, sixth place individual with Jonathan and then the 10th place individual uh, for AJ. And I think it's important to note that this is AJ's first competition. He had never been on a regulation uh, firefighter combat challenge course uh, before this competition. I think that's an outstanding accomplishment. Um, uh, and I've got a video that I'd like to share with you, Mr. Chairman, but before we get spun up with the excitement of the video, I just want to point out that uh, uh, while the city uh, foots the bill for these, these, this team to travel, their lodging, their meal expenses, and, and I and they uh, are greatly appreciative of that, these guys make time on their own, out of their schedules, off-duty, several days a week to practice on their own. 
they are competing in some cases against teams who are who ha- against fire departments that have teams that are dedicated to firefighter combat challenge. So when our folks go to work to work on engine three, some other departments in the country, they have a firefighter combat challenge team that goes to work and that's what they do for their shift is do is practice firefighter combat challenge. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury to be able to do that. And I, mm-hmm. I just think it says a lot about these guys, uh, their dedication to the department and to the sport, uh, and just how much heart uh, and competitive drive they have uh, when they can compete at the level they do. And I just think that needs to be recognized before we get on to the video. But I'm ready for that if you are. You're here, Mr. Chairman, we are. I'm going to, um, I could not get this to play in a conventional manner. I'm going to play this off of our um, Twitter feed. And before I start the video, uh, so you're going to, I'm going to get some backing vocals from ACDC, which I'm really proud to be able to announce this evening. But you you may hear the, the, uh, the commentator in the background say that the team we're running against is Ashbury's Heroes. And uh, so this is the championship relay event. Um, And what that other team tried to do uh, was essentially put together a group of all stars. So what they did was they, they, they knew who at this competition could run to some of the fastest individual times and they assembled a team. So they don't, they're not carrying a fire department's name They They assembled a team of all stars to try to beat us. Um, uh, they were not as fast as they thought they were. Uh, mm-hmm. So here we go. Uh, starting it off. This is a reminder. This is the toughest two minutes in sports. Uh, Pat's going to lead off. And uh, I don't hear any volume, and, and you may not be getting any volume either, but uh, Pat's leading us off up the tower. That's a 42-pound hose pack he's carrying. Uh, you can um, – he's at the, he's going to be met at the top by Jordan. Jordan's on the hose hoist. Uh, this, is a, this is also a 42-pound hose roll coming up. Uh, it is 44 feet 7 inches to the top rail of that tower. There are 73 steps coming down. Jonathan's bringing us down. Uh, you uh, are allowed to skip steps going up, but you must touch everyone going down. Uh, we're going to get the baton handoff here to Ben. He's going to drive the sled with four strikes. I think he probably could have done it in three. That's a 160-pound beam. He's driving five feet with a nine-pound dead blow hammer. Uh, and then Jonathan's back through the delineators. That's 140 feet. And then AJ's on the hose advance. Uh, that's 75 feet. And it's important here to have somebody who's big and heavy, uh, strong, but also fast. And AJ meets that, meets those qualifications. Then back to Ben on rescue. Randy, we rescue. Randy weighs 175 pounds and he's going to move at 106 feet. So, uh, there you have it, Mr. Chavin, um, in, in a business where, uh, getting to an emergency in a hurry, uh, truly does make a difference that we can measure. Uh, they ran through that course in 74 seconds. Wow. That's huge. Can, can we give them a round of applause? I, 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 everybody push mute so we don't want to be too loud. So we certainly support you. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Chief. I want to say to the gentleman who, who came back with the hardware, um, not to throw myself in it, but I have some level of understanding what it's like to compete on a national stage. I'm one of those weird guys. I like to see people win. So as long as Tom Brady and LeBron James can win championships, I'm a fan of theirs. You guys come back every year with the championship. So thank you so much. And here's what makes the difference for me. Other teams will put together and dedicate it to win. I know that if there's an emergency, if there's a fire, um, if there's a situation where we need rescue, the people who won these events are going to come to your door and going yep. to protect and serve. So that means a lot. And, and you're going to do it. You're going to be strong. You're going to be efficient. And you're going to be quick. So again, on behalf of the committee, we thank you for representing our, our, our city. And you certainly bring honor to it. Is there anyone else who has any words on item G1? I just want to. Yep. Councilmember Burke. 
Thank you, Chairman Taylor. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to also say congratulations, Chief Mayo, and to the team. You are you have really represented the city well, and we are so proud of your accomplishments. So thanks again, and congratulations. Congrats. We always love to do this in, per in person, but you know we're gonna have to settle for virtual right now. So gentlemen, just know sincerely, we appreciate you and congratulations on your success. Thanks for your service to the city. Item G2, please. Item G2, recognition of the Winston-Salem Fire Department by the North Carolina Department of Labor, Safety and Health Achievement and Recognition Program. Ms. Tony. We don't get to see the video. Oh, um, that's a good question. And the chief talked about ACDC and queued the video up so well, um, and I just moved right over it. Let's give it the respect that it deserves. Let's, let's play the video. I think he thought he was playing it. We just couldn't see it. I thought I was playing it, Mr. Chairman. I am really disappointed because I was doing my best <laughs> narration. <He was> commentating. <laughs> uh, we're, all, we're, all, we're all anticipating here. <laughs> Let me share my screen again. Let me, let me try again. Here we go. I get to do this all over, boy. This is really a treat. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Winston-Salem on the red side. Uh, an, an attempt to be all-star team on the blue side. They did the best they could, bless their hearts. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, and you still don't have any sound, I don't think. Uh, but again, here we go. Pad up the tower, 42-pound uh, hose pack. Uh, Jordan is waiting at the top. He's going to hoist a 42-pound hose roll. It's 44 feet, 7 inches to the top rail of the stair tower. Wow. Jonathan's going to bring us down 73 steps on that tower. You can skip them going up, but you must touch every one coming down. Ben's going to drive the sled. That's a 160-pound I-beam. He's going to drive it with a nine-pound dead blow mallet, five feet. Picks up the baton. Off to Jonathan through the delineators for 140-foot slalom. AJ down at the other end waiting for the hose advance. This is a 75-foot charged inch and three-quarter hose line. And then Ben's waiting to take the baton to the hose drag. This is the last evolution on the course. He's going to move 175-pound mannequin rescue Randy 106 feet. And now, Mr. Chairman, you have it in 74 seconds, sir. <laughs> All right. Wow. Here, here. That, I'm glad we showed the video because that actually added some perspective. Um, I don't know how you do it, but you do it and you do it every year. So, so thanks again. Now, Bro, we'll item, item G2. Okay. Thank you, Chairman <laughs> Taylor. And, and once again, thank you, Chief Mayo. This, this particular item is also recognizing the fire department, um, by the department of labor. The fire department was one of only five fire departments in the state to receive this prestigious credential. So, Chief Mayo. Thank you, Ms. Tony, and greetings again, Mr. Chairman. And I see the Mayor Pro Tem has joined us. Greetings to you, ma'am. I'm going to share my screen again. And um, as, as Ms. Tony uh, alluded to, there are 1,216, and I verified that today, there are 1,216 fire departments in the state of North Carolina. Five of them are uh, sharp accredited. Uh, the truth of the matter is that this is a bigger barrier than most folks are willing to wrestle. Uh, the Safety and Health Achievement Recognition Program is administered through the Consultative Services Bureau of the Occupational Safety and Health Division of the North Carolina Department of Labor. And it recognizes uh, small and mid-sized employers that establish, implement, and maintain exceptional workplace safety standards and programs. Uh, so the fire department has, uh, what this means is that the fire department has successfully navigated all the requirements of a full service 
Safety and Health Consultation by the Department of Labor. And just some highlights of that, that, that they've verified that we conduct sa- daily surveillance of hazard controls, uh, that we have an effective hazard reporting system. Uh, we conduct accident investigations for root cause analysis. Uh, we perform job hazard analyses. We ensure engineering controls are in place. We ensure OSHA mandated programs are in place. We make sure proper personal protective equipment is being used. We analyze workplace injury and illness incident data to improve processes uh, that we deliver the appropriate training to supervisors and employees and that employees are afforded the opportunity to be involved in safety and health issues. Um, uh, and and the, the, uh, so you, what you see here in the, in the picture is uh, some of our folks who were uh, who went up for the ceremony to receive the accreditation and, and the flags and other things that, that come along with it. Um, I'd like to recognize some folks. Uh, I'm going to stop my share. Uh, they are on the call with us. And um, Mr. Chairman, would, would I be out of line to ask uh, everybody who's not being recognized to turn their video off and for, uh, for the folks who are being video, who are being recognized to turn their video on so they'll come, come up to the top? Yes, sir. We can make those accommodations. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I'm going to just ask these folks to give a wave when I call their names. Uh, Assistant Chief Tad Byram was the Assistant Chief of Safety and Training when we kicked off uh, our pursuit of, of uh, SHARP accredited status about five years ago. So he got us started. And then uh, Assistant Chief Frank Stowe, who I don't see, uh, I, see him, uh, I saw him somewhere and he jumped around. Anyway, he's on the call. Assistant Chief Frank Stowe is now uh, the assistant chief of safety and training. So he has made sure that this, this pursuit has, 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 um, has carried on. Um, division chief of safety and training, uh, Sharice Moore is on the call and she has supported this effort through making sure that the safety and training officers, uh, had, had time and the resources, uh, to pursue this accreditation. Captain Chris Belcher, there's, there's chief Moore. Uh, Captain Chris Belcher uh, was the uh, the uh, eight to five training captain in the safety and training branch uh, when when most of this uh, when this got started and uh, he has he has seen it through to completion although he's back in the operations branch now he and Captain Marvin James uh, uh, Marvin's given away there he they they worked. Uh, hand in hand. Uh, they were both safety and training officers when a lot of this work was done. And then we could not have done this without the support of risk management. And uh, th- those folks are on the call with us also. Jason Bryant, Jason, if you'll give a wave there, and uh, Patrick Kessler, and also Julie Carter. They were They provided us a lot of support as we navigated um, uh, all the requirements of this accreditation. So uh, something that I'm very proud of, again, we, we uh, very few fire departments have, have achieved this. And, and the, the departments that have done it are small fire departments where they only have two or three facilities uh, to get through this. We have 19 fire stations getting ready to have 20, the Beatty, PSC, all of the facilities that we operate out of have to make it through this accreditation process. So that's why most of the larger fire departments just, uh, again, it's just not a, it's not, a, not a project that they're interested in undertaking just because of the enormity of it. But there you have it, Mr. Chairman. So much appreciation goes out to these folks who worked on this. Uh, and I thank you for recognizing them tonight. Recognizing them tonight. Thank you, Chief. I just want to take a moment on behalf of the committee and thank you all uh, for what you did to help us to be recognized for your participation in SHARP. I I say this a lot, but I mean it sincerely. You bring honor to our city. I admit my bias, but I believe based off situations like these, we have one of the best fire departments in the United States of America, and they just showed you why on the last two items. So thank you again for your service to the community. On item G2, members of the committee, is there anyone who wants to be recognized to have a few words? Seeing none, thank you, Chief, and thank you to all who participated to make this possible. 
Um, we appreciate your, your efforts. Uh, thank you. We'll move to item G3, please. Item G3, presentation on the hazardous devices unit. Assistant City Manager Tony. Thank you. This item G3 um, is actually was approved by Public Safety Committee last month. The uh, August Vernon and, and Assistant Chief Wilson Weaver wanted to present information around this grant that they plan to submit to um, the, the Homeland Security. So at this time, August, who is the Emergency Management Director and Assistant Chief Weaver will present this item. Gentlemen, you have the floor. Director Vernon, do you have anything you want to state? Uh, no, sir. I'll just uh, hand the baton off to you, Chief. Good evening, Chair Taylor, Council Members Burke, Council Member Mundy, Council Member Larson, other city officials, as well as city government staff. I'm W.S. Weaver II, your Assistant Police Chief over the Winston-Salem Police Department Patrol and Special Operations Divisions. With me tonight are Captain Brian Doby, as well as Corporal Eddie King, who is from our Hazardous Devices Unit, or otherwise known as our Bomb Squad. WSPD has had a Hazardous Devices Unit for well over 40 years, and tonight we'd just like to provide some information with you regarding our Hazardous Devices Unit. As ACM Tony stated, the grant was submitted at Director Vernon's leadership through the Office of the Winston-Salem Forsyth County Office of Emergency Management for a 2021 Homeland Security Grant, which is a regional grant through the North Carolina Division of Emergency Management. Uh, that grant will be utilized by the Winston-Salem Police Department. It'll be utilized by our Hazardous Devices Unit to purchase a new advanced portable X-ray generator. Portable X-rays are used by bomb technicians around the world to investigate dangerous and suspicious packages, devices, items, and people. As you know, we just finished our tour of duty with the Carolina Classic Fair yesterday. Members of our Hazardous Devices Unit were present in the event a suspicious item were discovered at that venue. So Corporal King, would you please begin our presentation? Yes, sir, thanks, Chief. Um, again, I'm Corporal King. I'm the commander of the Hazardous Devices Unit. And just kind of give you an overview of uh, some of the things that, that, that we have going on with our team. Um, uh, we have a, a small slide presentation for you. If you go to the next slide. Uh, some of the credentials that we have, we are certified by the FBI. Uh, everybody that, that is on our team has to go through a 40-hour hazardous material school, which is in, located in uh, Anniston, Alabama. It's one of the, uh, it's a very large FEMA location. Um, not only that, once you get down there, then we attend a 240 hours of basic bomb school, which is in Huntsville, Alabama. Once you have attain your certification there, then you have to recertify every three years. Uh, myself and uh, another one of my technicians were down there just a few weeks ago. Um, it, it was that they change things up every every so many years, so you're not seeing the same thing. So we're learning. Uh, what's going on not, along, not only in North Carolina, but all the United States and across the world. Um, my technicians have to have 288 hours of training every year. Uh, sometimes that can get taxing, um, but it's, it, if, if we want them to know the job, we have to train them how to do the job. And we, we train two to three times a month um, to attain those training hours. Plus, we also have to have uh, 40 hours of advanced training. Uh, you, a lot of that is usually on homemade explosives, um, advanced electronics, fireworks, things of that nature. And we all wrap it up to about 120 to 140 calls a year. So uh, we stay fairly busy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some of the other trainings that we go to, uh, the incident response to terrorist bombings, which is in Socorro, New Mexico. Um, again, all, all these courses I'm getting ready to read off to you, the federal government pays us to go there. Um, so that most of the time, the only thing it costs the city is a little bit of fuel. 
Um, the FBI also does several uh, advanced electronic classes. Uh, sometimes they do road shows to where they'll get four or five different squads in different regions together and meet at one central location. Uh, we also go to uh, some of the ATF schools uh, to learn about homemade explosives and things that are coming on the horizon. Uh, we're part of the International Association, Association of Bomb Techs and Investigators. We, they, they put on a 40 hour a year training for us uh, that, that, we, that we attend. Uh, and one of the biggest schools that we get to go to is at, is at Texas A&M. Um, it's for military ordinance and unexploded ordinance. Uh, you, it's, some people have a hard time believing that we, we recover a lot of military ordinance uh, within the city and our outlying areas. Next slide, please. I talked about our outlying areas. We cover 14 counties. Uh, here's our primary coverage area here. Uh, there's a lot of times we we have to uh, takes us a little bit to get there, but we eventually make it. Um, but uh, again, anytime we go out of out of county, we always have a secondary team standing by because our primary response is Winston Salem. So we always make sure we have folks there. Um, and on the next slide, uh, you'll see is a secondary coverage area. Some of these. Some of these locations have squads, uh, such as Guilford, uh, Greensboro PD has a, has a bomb squad, um, along with uh, Cabarrus County and obviously Charlotte and Mecklenburg. Um, but if they're tied up on things, sometimes they'll give us a call and we have to cover part of their area. So um, we work very well with, uh, with the other agencies. And um, when, when they call, we're always ready to, ready to respond with the equipment that you folks have provided. Next slide, please. Uh, here at WSPD, uh, we cover some of the other areas. Um, anytime HDU can be dispatched statewide or sent to surrounding states, because we are, we fall under the FBI and we do the training um, at their schoolhouse in Huntsville, Alabama. We're not at their beck and call, but they will once in a while call and say, "Hey, can you go assist with working these events, or be on standby while another squad works works some larger events." Um, we were kind of second in line when it come to the last Super Bowl. We thought we was going to get to go, but um, we got put on the back burner. And so we had to cover some other other uh, jurisdictions when it come to that. So um, that that's – I told somebody the other day I was not retiring until I get to work a Super Bowl as a bomb tech. So, um, <laughs> uh, but, but again, we, 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 we get to cover some large areas. So, um, but they're, they're really good about – Paying, paying our way there. So, uh, next slide. Uh, this is actually a photo from a call uh, we had up in uh, Stokes County. Uh, we had some pipe bombs up there a little while at the end of last year. Um, but some of the different calls we go on are uh, suspicious packages. Uh, we do post blast scenes. Again, military ordinance and fireworks. Fireworks are our biggest headache sometimes. Um, and people will say, okay, it's just a firework. Well, everybody saw what happened in, in Los Angeles a few months ago. Um, we, have, we have that same equipment. So we're, fireworks, fireworks make us nervous. So, um, so we're, obviously we're extra careful when we deal with anything. Uh, but one of the first things we do, uh, and speaking about this grant, we x-ray everything. So we want to know what's in there before we go messing with it. Next slide. Uh, here's some of the stuff that we've recovered in, in the last couple of years. Um, as you can see in that photograph, uh, there are some anti-tank mines, um, illumination rounds, law rocket. Um, fortunately, those were empty. They were just the tubes that, 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 which fire the law rockets. Um, but we, we recover a lot of this stuff um, in, the, in our response area. So... Uh, Again, that's why it's so important for us to x-ray this stuff, uh, the, these pieces of ordinance, is so we know if they're live, if they've been demilled. Uh, and if we're looking at the x-ray and we're not sure, uh, we, we, we upload that into an email and we send it 
to our military partners and they, they are always ready to assist us in everything. Um, and you know, if it's, if it's live, uh, they tell us how, uh, the proper procedure in to disposing of it. Um, if it's going to make a big mess and if it's like a mustard gas, something like that, they get in the trucks and they come and get it from us because we don't want to keep that on, on ourselves. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, here's just some uh, photograph of some hand grenades that we've recovered in the past uh, year or so. Again, some of the more the majority of our uh, military ordnance that we do recover is hand grenades. Um, as you can see, these have been demilled, um, but you, you never know until you take an X-ray of them. You know, we've had everything from uh, World War II Japanese grenades to uh, Russian hand grenades. Um, just there's just a lot of stuff out there, so we're we, uh, we we do everything we can to make sure that that we preserve them uh, until we can get to a place where we can either counter charge them or if they're demilled again if they're demilled then they're safe. But we always take an X-ray just to make sure. Next slide. Um, there's just a list of, of, of some of the stuff in the last 12 months. Again, some smoke grenades, some flares, rocket launchers, uh, some grenades, ground bursting simulators, and booby trap simulators. Uh, we do live close to a military base, and unfortunately, sometimes those items do walk off the base, and we find them. Um, another reason why we find a lot of them, years ago, like during Vietnam and Korea, when you left those, those war zones, you just kept what you had in your pockets, and unfortunately, those war heroes are passing on and their family members are cleaning out their basements and outbuildings and they're finding these uh, mostly hand grenades and that they've kept for a souvenir. And um, so we get a call on those. Next slide. Uh, some of the big things that we end up having to um, conduct uh, sweeps at, uh, most of the time, we when there's a race at Charlotte, they call us down there to assist because it's such a large area. Uh, major sporting events, uh, Wake Forest, uh, Winston-Salem State, the, those are major events because there's a lot of people. Um, the cycling classics, um, we're, we work those events as well. Uh, Smith and Rose Airport, when we have uh, VIPs coming in, uh, whether it be presidents, presidential hopefuls, um, senators, congressmen, um, a lot of times they, they ask us to go sweep those areas to make sure that uh, nothing's been planted or nothing's um, going to be out there to harm anyone. And most of the time they're staying in a hotel uh, here in town, so we go check their rooms out and their hotels out to make sure they're safe. Next slide. Well, that's it for my presentation. Thank you so much for, for your attending this. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Let me break in right here. Captain Doby, do you have anything? No, sir. Um, chairman, members of the Public Safety Committee, we just appreciate your support with the, as you can see, with the amount of counties that our hazardous device unit covers, having uh, state-of-the-art equipment and the vehicles we need to get to some of these areas that are either rural or a long way away is essential to making sure everybody gets back safe and we get this stuff transported to a safe location or we're able to uh to take care of it at the location without transporting it takes a lot of different pieces of equipment to do that so we appreciate all your help with that thank, thank you. you and chair taylor i'd like to say that i am your lead instructor for anti-terrorism and Homeland Defense for the Winston-Salem Police Department, your expectation as well as the citizens of our community, and that's not only Winston-Salem, but the surrounding community, are to be prepared for any type of event that may occur. And our Hazardous Devices Unit is a part of that readiness response. Keep in mind that our Hazardous Devices Unit may have to respond to in, uh, incidents involving chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, explosive, or incendiary types of devices. And we are prepared to deal with any of those types of uh, threats that may come into our community. With that being said, our department has the training, has the education to perform as a full function law enforcement agency, which includes dealing with some of these hazardous devices that we may find that may occur from us. You know, that can go anywhere from an improvised explosive device 
where we've had kids that have played with fireworks and caused all types of issues all the way up to grandpa has something over in the barn and we don't know what it is, but it may be dynamite that we may have to deal with. And so being prepared to respond to those things are part of what we do as a part of our readiness. Uh, this is an information item only. And so there's no actual action uh, required tonight uh, from the Public Safety Committee. But if you have any questions, we're available to answer them, please. Thank you, Assistant Chief Weaver. Um, there are some questions, but I want to say to you, Captain Dovey and Corporal King, thank you for your service again. Nothing makes me more nervous than citizens walking around with dynamite or grenades from World War I or World War II. We're talking 1914 to 1918 or 1939 to 45 in World War II. I mean, that, that is mind-boggling. I mean, so much could go wrong there, but I'm glad to know that you are the watchman on the gate making sure that we're safe. Councilman Larson, you have questions about the uh, yes. hazardous situation. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two, two real questions. One is sort of, do we have any canine support in this program? Do you use, do you use to get dogs, sniff dogs for detection? Yeah. Of we devices? have access to a, a bomb detection canine through the sheriff's office. We sure. with the police department don't actually have a canine that serves that specific purpose. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And the second question, I noticed in one of your slides, it says some of our current system is outdated manufacturer no longer offers technical support for our x-ray system. Is that, is that the status of our x-ray support? Corporal King, can you answer that? Yeah, the, the one we, we currently have now is made by Logos and uh, they no longer make uh, the technical uh, components for it or even some of the, the hardware for it. So that's why we're moving, that's why we need to move on to this newer system uh, made by a different company. Do we have we have that ordered up? Is this paid for? We have a program for replacing this equipment. Yeah, that that that's uh, well um, that that we spoke with um, the public safety committee on a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, hey, thank thank you. So we're good. Yes, sir. You you you're good. You got what you need. Yes, sir. Thank you, Councilman Larson. Your question satisfied, sir. Yes, thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tem Badgers. Thank you, Chair Taylor. Uh, Assistant Chief Weaver, uh, since the pandemic started uh, almost 19 months ago, <clears throat> have we seen an increase in the uh, hazardous devices the hazardous year over year? The <laughs> hazardous devices unit uh, receives about 100 calls every year of various types. And so I can't say that anything has changed with COVID. Uh, you know, people are still finding some things that, whether it's, you know, how you've seen these uh, grenades mounted on a piece of wood that says pull pin to ask a question or something along those lines. So some of these novelty items come up from time to time in various places around the city where we have to actually deal with those as if they're a live device until we determine that they are not. And so I can't say that we saw any increase in uh, our responses, but we at least stayed uh, the same with about what we've done for the past few years. Is that correct, Corporal King? Yes, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions on item G3 uh, for the hazardous, hazardous device, device unit team? Seeing no, no further questions, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we look forward to uh, your continued uh, prosperity in what you do. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you. Um, well, before we move to item G4, speaking of keeping us safe, and I know uh, Director Vernon, if you're still on the call, I tell the same story every single time. When I first started off, Mayor Pro, I mean, Mayor Pro Tem Burt uh, was running the Public Safety Committee. And anytime that Director Vernon was in the house or anybody in emergency management, she'd ask one question. Uh, we do know there are some challenges. You know, and we can't account for everything, but she always asks one thing that I'm going to ask today. Director Vernon, in the event of an emergency, are we prepared? Absolutely, sir. And that, uh, and part of that means that we never stop training, planning, exercises, equipment. Uh, even during COVID, you know, some of that had to slow down, but we've continued on with all those, those efforts, which never ends. Uh, it's never any process. But the equipment like this uh, certainly helps in that process. So definitely we're prepared, but we're always going to be vigilant and uh, keep an eye on the horizon for any new dangers or issues. 
Well, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't ask you that question. So thanks for stepping up and answering it. And we certainly see from the fruit of your work that we are prepared. Thanks for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Item G4, please. Item G4, Crime Prevention Plan Update. Assistant City Manager Tony. Yes, thank you, Chairman Taylor. Okay, get my screen ready. Okay, so this presentation is the Crime Prevention Plan Update. I mentioned update because the budget for a crime prevention plan was budgeted in the FY22 budget. It is now since prepared to be funded through ARPA funding, just recently approved. And so I just wanted to review where we are with the crime prevention plan. So just quickly, I, I just kind of wanted to give a visual on why this is so important. It's, it has been an important issue for our community. This slide represents the year 2020. This is a calendar year starting with January. And you can see the number of violent firearm offenses in the city of Winston-Salem. So this is color coded by ward. The red is for homicide. The blue is for aggravated assault. That means a person was shot. And then the yellow is for discharging firearms. Um, it can be in the occupied dwelling or in a vehicle. And so you can see how this is dispersed across the city and the clusters of uh, people who've been shot and, and, and firearms that have been discharged in the community. So this next slide is just for th this current year of 2021, year to date, and, and I say year to date up through the end of September that this map was created. And so it looks very similar to the discharging firearms, the yellow, the number of homicides, and, and the number of assault. But keep in mind, once again, this year is not complete. And so this map continues to grow as we continue to have additional violent crime using firearms. So this chart shows from 2017 what the actual numbers are for citywide shooting incidents. So in 2017, there were 38 for the year. 2018, it was 105, and this was from September to September for each year. In 2019, 77. 2020, there were 141. And as of September 16th, there were 118 uh, shootings citywide. And so keep in mind, this number continues to grow. And even within the last couple of weeks, there have been a number of shooting incidents. So this number is really uh, higher. I wanna just point out that the Winston-Salem Police Department does a number of community crime prevention efforts that are in place. They are actively um, hosting these programs. Some are citizen academies and youth programs that the police department offers. They also do community watch and correspondence programs. So this would be our neighborhood watches, our national night out, which just recently happened. Of course, Crime Stoppers is a way the community can get involved in, in calling in and, and uh, helping police officers solve crime. And then you have a number of, of other correspondents through apps like Nextdoor. In Patrol, there are several community efforts that include walk and talk foot patrols, ride with the ward, things like that. There's a gang prevention unit and steering committee and then there are other community support efforts. So when we're talking about crime and crime prevention, it's really a community-wide uh, issue and, and the community plays an integral part in helping the police to solve crime and prevent crime. I specifically wanted to pull out the gang unit and their prevention efforts. And so that the community is aware that the police department has a gang unit in place. It has been in operation since 2006. They currently have a sergeant, a gang sergeant, two gang corporals, four gang police officers. 
And so their primary function is to identify, investigate gangs, gang members, and gang-related crimes. So, of course, their three approaches would be prevention, intervention, and suppression. They also partner with a gang steering committee. So that is an operation that consists of various citizens in the community and, and community leaders for that gang. So the gang unit over the years have received several awards. And so this is a, a award-winning gang unit. And so you see on the right-hand side some of their accomplishments and things that the gang unit has done. In 2018, they seized over 140 firearms, which that is significant and great. They also assisted the sheriff's office in the recent Mount Tabor shooting, and they provide support to the school resources officers um, with their gang intelligence. Uh, they provide information and presentations to various schools like Main Street Academy, Mount Tabor, and they are scheduled to do presentations at Parkland and North Forsyth High School. They also assisted and partnered with the Department of Probation and Parole, the North Carolina Gang Investigators Association, the ATF, and other federal agencies. So this is just an FYI that this unit is in place and they are doing some excellent work around gang prevention. Now, moving on to the crime prevention plan, this is just a breakdown of the budget that council approved for the plan. Council approved a $1.35 million crime prevention plan budget. You can see the breakdown here in numbers, and I actually will go through each of these individually. Um, and I have these numbers in four, you'll see twice, that wasn't by mistake. We'll look at that in a potential combined um, sense that, that we can address these two items. So starting with number one is to double the number of SOAR participants. So the SOAR program championed by Chairman Councilmember Taylor is has done a, has been a great program for the city. Currently, they have eight participants who work um, six months, 32 hours a week, and they are integrated into the city environment and are placed after they are trained into various city departments like recreation, sanitation, fleet operations, and, and other departments. And so this has been a successful program. And so part of the crime prevention plan would be to double the program. So $300, $300,000 could double the program where they will be 16 participants. Uh, the staff has put out applications. And so they are currently recruiting additional candidates for the SOAR program. I think because of COVID and some other issues, they're slightly behind in reaching that number, but that is still the goal and the resources are there to, to double the program. Okay, number two was a pre-K initiative. That investment would be $350,000. This was championed by Mayor Pro Tem Adams. Looking at pre-K and early education as a crime prevention opportunity um, to prevent crime long-term. As people are educated early, it serves as a great intervention for crime. So in April of 2021, the council and Forsyth County County Commissioners approved the creation of a Community Early Childhood Education Task Force to lead the community in developing a plan for ensuring that all Forsyth County children have access to high quality pre-K. So they are due to have a report presented in March of 2022. So right now, staff are meeting with the local pre-K system to discuss the most impactful uses of the city's crime prevention plan funding that is allocated to go towards this. And so there's information about pre-K initiative and here's a link um, if you have access to this presentation. Number three is Secure Violence Global. So Cure Violence is a, a, a national program. It has been successful in 
many other cities, including Durham and Greensboro, and Charlotte is getting ready to launch a cure violence program as well. So locally, um, we are considering cure violence in our crime prevention plan. We've earmarked two hundred thousand dollars. We'll see what other kind of resources would be necessary, and so uh, because the program will serve the entire county or will be projected to, we are partnering with Forsyth County in looking at developing or bringing in this cure violence program. So the goal is to stop the spread of violence by using methods and strategies associated with disease control. And so that is detecting and interrupting conflicts. The second would be to identify and treat the highest risk individuals. And number three would be to change social norms. So those are the three areas of the cure violence approach that um, uses this model, and it is an evidence-based model. So, so this is why this particular program would be potentially beneficial for our community as it has been evidence-based to actually stop the spread of violence. So the next steps with the Cure Violence Program, we have developed a Cure Violence Task Force. So that task force includes city and county staff, includes myself and, and the deputy uh, county manager for the county. It includes Council Member Taylor, as well as Commissioner Fleming Elamine. It also includes the school superintendent, Judge Hartsfield, um, some of the juvenile justice um, advocates at the court. So there is a very comprehensive task force that has started meeting. There will be a, a several upcoming meetings of the task force. The county has been willing to pay for the assessment for the Cure Violence um, Global to come in locally and to assess our community. And so this is just an assessment and see number two, Cure Violence Community Assessment, uh, that will be happening in the next couple of months. Probably next month is, is the goal, where they will come in, they will look at agencies, they'll look at our data, crime data, where crime is occurring, our institutions, and then they will provide kind of a recommendation and model for how we would move forward. Keep in mind, they create the model, but we would utilize local, partners, local nonprofits, faith-based entities to actually implement. So, so they'll give us kind of the, the recommendations, the layout, they will offer training, but it will be up to the local community and local nonprofits to actually implement and determine the resources needed um, as a next step for cure violence. So item number four, I combined two of the budgeted items. So one is recreation center programming, mentorship stipends, and conflict resolution programs. So one bucket is 200,000, the second bu bu bucket is $250,000. And so part of this is that we have identified an actual position called a youth violence prevention manager or administrator. That person is going to be Bryce Sherman. He currently works for the Department of, of Parks and Recreation or Recreation and Parks as we call it. And he is doing an outstanding job in his current role, developing their sports and athletics uh, area. The, the young people respond well to him. He's an African-American male and really connects to the youth in our community. He's also received several sports awards. So you see a few football pictures on here. So he's really a remarkable person. And actually he also helped with the National Black Theater Festival's Teen-tastic event. So he brought in some national artists so that the teens would be engaged during the theater festival up at the fairground. So he was instrumental in that as well. So the goal of the position will be in three parts. Number one is to enhance re recreation center programming, support conflict resolution programs, and to develop a mentorship program. Both of these, all of these areas were championed by Mayor Pro Tem Adams, who 
um, wanted more mentorship and more programming that teens actually like and will start utilizing our recreation center more. And, and council member Burke talked about more program around conflict resolution. And so we thought having a dedicated position to oversee some of these goals would be ideal in, in accomplishing um, some of these areas. And partly some of this, the 250 may be contracted out, but we want there to be a plan, a comprehensive plan about the approach. Some things that can be started immediately, and then some things can be developed, and we might bring nonprofits into the fold to assist with. Ms. Tony, before you change the slides, I just want to tell you that selecting Mr. Sherman was an excellent idea. He is well known and respected in the community, and I think he will go a long way to help us meet our goals and objectives for the program. Great selection. Thank you, Chairman Taylor, for that feedback. We, we, we really appreciate um, you, and, and, and we hope Bryce Sherman does a good job, and we really think he will in this capacity. This slide is just to mention that the Recreation Department actually has quite a few team programming currently in place. And so you'll see the map here. Most of the programs are at the Minnie Lee Davis Community Center, also formerly known as 14th Street Recreation Center. And so what Bryce will do is, number one, make sure the community is aware of some of these existing programs. Some are really well run. Some are partnerships with other nonprofits, like uh, Parenting Path is now at the Haynes Hosiery, um, Empowering Our Teens Mentoring Program at William R. Anderson Community Center. Parenting Path is also at the, the Sims Center. Um, but at the Minnie Lee Davis Community Center, there is a boxing ring. And so there has been real successful boxing program that's actually led by one of our internal uh, custodial staff who's doing an amazing job. I meant to bring the link to the video, but I will share it at a later time that's really bringing people in and teaching them the skill of boxing. And there's a, a, a bit of conflict resolution in that programming as well. So, so there are some great programs that exist, but we are looking to enhance, it, enhance these programs as well as get feedback from teens on what they think is working well and what we can add to really get them using these rec centers more. And lastly is the gun buyback program. This was recommended by Council Member Burke. We budgeted $50,000. The objectives would be to reduce the availability of guns in the community. Number two would be to provide an opportunity for safe disposal of firearms. And three, this helps to mobilize community, raise awareness, and hopefully shifts the culture about uh, guns and having illegal guns on the street or in the wrong hands. And so Chairman Taylor, that ends my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Tony. Uh, before we move to questions from council members and committee members, I want to give an opportunity to recognize Chief Thompson, who we know, love, and respect. Chief, you know, again, thank you for your service. We want to give you the floor to see if you have anything to add to the conversation, um, or do you just want to wait for questions? Thank you, Chair Taylor. Um, and good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Adams and um, other members of, of council. Um, I appreciate Chair Taylor reaching out to me. First off, I want to echo what you said about um, Mr. Sherman. Um, our department has had the opportunity to work with Bryce Sherman um, on a couple of occasions during our National Black Theater Festival. And I think his youthfulness, as well as his ability to connect to the young people in our community, will be excellent. I think he was an excellent choice for this program. So we look forward to, to partnering with him again and will assist as a police department in any way that we can. You know, although we are attacking gun violence, the community support here will help immensely. Um, personally, I uh, just would like to ask, and I, I don't even know what it would look like, but as we look at this, um, the challenges that we are having 
um, off the violence and particularly gun violence side of things. I think, as we've said in the past, this is a huge problem and it's going to take holistic approach uh, for us to, to resolve it and, and really get our arms wrapped around it. As such, uh, with, with you thinking about violence, particularly gun violence, being a uh, health problem or health disparity, um, I think that at some point during this process, um, we might want to look at bringing on our medical staff, medical professionals here. Uh, as we all know, we have some of the best um, uh, medical facilities um, in the state of North Carolina. And I think that they could probably add some value to our efforts here. Um, again, I don't know what that looked like, but I'd love to hear some of the things they would have to share and what they can contribute to our overall plan. And then finally, um, I had the opportunity to have this conversation um, at length when Dr. Harrison, the former um, school superintendent, was here. I have not had the conversation um, with, with uh, Trisha McManus, our current superintendent, but I also think that in, in looking and reading about other communities that we could probably, and I don't know what it would take to do it, but to have Salvation Army Boys and Girls Clubs in our schools, I think, you know, when you look at, we talk about the pre-K program, which I think is something that is desperately needed. And um, just as mentioned in the presentation, if we start from the beginning, and give kids an education and understanding they have confidence and know along the way that they can be someone in life and they can act, they can be uh, contributing members of society and help to grow our community. I think that steers them away from the threat or the enticement of gangs and gangs activities or any type of criminal activity. So I think that's one thing. Um, and it is a long-term solution, but we gotta start somewhere. And so I, I love seeing that we are involved in, in a plan. Our plan includes that. But also I do believe that we have a lot of kids in our community who after school, their supervision, if it exists, it's extremely low. Um, if we could, and again, I don't know what it would look like, but if we could be a community that could add boys and girls clubs to some of our schools here in Winston, I think that would be a huge uh, move towards getting where we want to go and eliminate some of the violence. In addition to our um, recreation centers, we create another location for kids to have the mentoring support that they, can, they need, to have the support of homework, to have supervision, to have the opportunity to interact with their peers outside of the academic world, and to have the opportunity to, to um, learn about conflict resolution. Again, that's a huge ask, but um, I think it's worth us exploring as a community. Thank you, sir. Chief, you are absolutely correct. Thanks for your comments. I started my community work attending and working at the Boys and Girls Club, and that's exactly the point where we need to get these kids. So that, that may not be something that we can solve overnight, but it's an excellent suggestion on how we can make some progress on reducing crime and violence in our community. Um, what I want to do, thank you, uh, ACM Tony. Thank you, Chief, for the comments and the presentation. Let's move to the council uh, for comments or questions. I saw Mayor Pro Tip Adams' hand. Is there anyone else who wishes to be recognized? If so, we'll queue you up, but we'll let um, MPT Adams speak first. Thank you, uh, Chair Taylor. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Ms. Tony, and all of the committee that's uh, president council members. Uh, the Chief is right. Uh, it's going to be a Herculean effort, but we got to start somewhere. And that's what we've been trying to get the community to understand. This problem didn't happen overnight. It happened over the course of decades. And when you have what we have now, I think the suggestion, Chief, uh, we're on the same page. Uh, when it comes to the mentoring piece, the, pro the point is, or the, the, the issue will be, you can't do that in certain spaces. Uh, if you're mentoring a child, or even if you're mentoring an adult, it's got to be treated just like a safe space for mental and physical illness. It's got to be private in some degree. Let's say uh, we have a mentoring program 
And we have these programs at Haynes or Martin Luther or the Anderson Center. If a child or a parent signs up, a teacher recommends, a community leader recommends, whatever, you can't bring them in that same space where all these other people are at. You got to allow them the space and the facilitator or mentor to do their job, the, the mental illness people outside of the space. Then they eventually come back. It's like treatment in a way. So I'm hoping that we all can work together to figure out how we make that happen. It might be that the safe space is a recreation center in our communities, but whatever day that these individuals have signed to, to be up like an appointment, that nobody knows they're gonna be there. The gangs don't know, their friends don't know, the bullies don't know, the drug dealers don't know but they're there to be in a safe space, to be able to have a better life for them. Their parents want them there, grandma, whoever. And they wanna be there, but they can't do this in the open. And I hope all of y'all understand. Council Member Taylor, I know you, do. you can't do this where your enemies and bullies and haters see this because now you're under attack, your family's under attack, your house is under attack, possible shootings. So, Chief, I'm looking to you and your team, uh, Ms. Tony, Councilmember Taylor, to figure out that piece as well, because the mentorship piece and the conflict resolution piece, we've got to figure out how do we create a safe space that the people participating actually know is safe and it's not going to be a well I saw and they got a video on social media showing them going in a wreck where they're getting counseling or trying to get their act together. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Councilman Larson. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Bryce Sherman and congratulate him on his new position. Um, it is good to have a Gamecock on staff and moving forward. Um, we, um, it's part of, it's part of a mosaic though. Tonight we walk away from the idea that this is a multi faceted program that we're constructing here. A lot of it's new pre K is new. There's a lot of this crime prevention is new. Uh, we are moving forward on a variety of fronts. I think chief Thompson has said though, the core of this issue is public involvement and remains public involvement. And we'll have to have the public involved with the mentorship program, with the pre-K program, uh, with the support of our uh, recreation centers. Uh, and I would encourage to use this opportunity to move us to a new level of involvement as citizens in our crime prevention programs. Uh, but I'm very excited to see, and I thank the, everybody who puts this program together, the various departments and components of it. It is a wonderful mosaic, and I'm very optimistic that it can have an impact if we implement Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Larson. And I just want uh, this council and committee to know, uh, maybe I shouldn't let the cat out the bag, but you know, the, we all know about the Youth Build program. Um, some of you had some, some concerns and some input, and I just want you to know, we haven't finalized things, but we are in the process of working to reach those young men and women between the ages of 16 and 24. We'll still look to focus on construction, but we also wanna reach out into science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, in a job shadowing type program. So I think we're gonna really make some progress there along with SOAR, uh, Pre-K and some of the other team programming we've discussed. Uh, but I just wanted you guys to know that as we move forward so you wouldn't be blindsided by it. Um, you've requested it and we, we've gone to the table thanks to ACM Johnny Taylor and his crew for helping the, to pull things together. Mr. Garrity, thank you as well. And I think this program is gonna be good for the community. Uh, Councilman Burke. Yes, thank you so much, Chair Taylor. Uh, Assistant City Manager uh, Tony for the presentation. Um, I just want to say I agree with everything that has been said. Uh, thinking about what Chief Thompson said, we do have to make sure that we have programs, wholesome activities for our young people, and understand that all young people, no matter if they're in elementary school, they may not have that after school supervision. And thinking about how we used to have sports and different activities in middle school, those activities no longer exist. And we have got to create the safe space 
space. We've got to create the wholesome opportunities and activities. And when I go back and I look at the map where the violent crimes have occurred and uh, where a lot of them have been centralized, think about this. We do not have a recreation center in the location where many of these violent crimes have occurred. The closest recreation center, if you go back and look at the map, will be 14th Street Recreation Center. So we have got to really create a, a space for our kids, for our young people, so that they can take advantage of these conflict resol resolution programs. Um, so um, it's gonna take being very strategic and very intentional if we're going to address the issues that uh, we, we read about every day. I also want to say that um, I agree with uh, our Mayor Pro Tem. When you want to reach young people, they have got to, first of all, trust that uh, what they share, that they will be safe with whatever they share. So we've got to find a way to create a situation where they know that no one will know about a conversation that they have with their mentor, uh, about a conversation that they have when they reach out for help. We've got to make sure we create that. And I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you to our chief. Thank you for all that you do and for all that your department does. You, we know you, uh, you have been under it this, you know, for the last months. And we appreciate you. We appreciate all that you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Burke. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on item G4? Councilman Mundy. I just want to echo the thanks and appreciation. I don't want Chief Thompson or the rest of the, um, the police force or anyone else on the call to think I'm not appreciative and supportive. It's just that everyone else has said it so well already. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thanks for your, your, addition, your addition, sir. It certainly made a difference. Um, is there anybody else on item G4? Okay. Uh, seeing nothing further, members of the committee and council, I call the final question. Are there any other further business that should be considered for the good of the order? Seeing nothing further, we'll consider this meeting to be adjourned. Thank you.